Thank you so much. It's really, really my pleasure to be here. I'm super excited. I am faculty here at Carnegie Mellon, and I get to teach this really, really wonderful course called Dal Croce Eurythmics. Today, we don't get at all to talk about the whole, the entirety of that course, but rather just one really narrow uh, concept that comes out of it, or a certain set of ideas that have come out of my research in that class over, over many years. Um, the Eurythmics class, though, I'll tell you just a teeny bit about it. It's a slightly zany course. Uh, there are no tables and chairs in my classroom. It's all taught barefoot, of all things. Um, and I don't even like being barefoot, but me and my students were we're all barefoot all day long uh, in the course. Uh, and the course dwells on the subject of musicianship. Musicianship is the term that we use to describe the set of skills that a musician would need if they're ever to hit the threshold of what we might call beautiful or truthful or artful. Um, most people, I think, uh, without thinking about it too much, I think most people consider that the, the major contribution of the musician is to make sound. Um, whereas my course works on the assumption that music is actually supposed to feel like something far more importantly than it ever sound like something. Um, we take some time in the course to uh, develop physical models that we hope we can use to parallel the artistic experience, the artful experience, and then we just sort of grow from there. When I was told that the theme for today was to be reinterpretation, I was like, score, because that <laughs> is a big, uh, big part of what it is that I do. A lot of, not, of course, not all of this coursework is dedicated to that, but a, a nice amount of what we do has to do with concepts around the, the notion of interpretation. Um, my students are all uh, musicians. They're all performers or composers, uh, and as in their in their, uh, in their jobs, in their future, the notion of being an interpreter is a pretty big deal. So we take all kinds of time to talk about interpretation from multiple angles. Um, and the more that we've talked about it, the more uh, we've recognized that there are all sorts of, there are, there are a number of rules, or I'll even go so far as to say as truths about being a music interpreter. And many of these truths are, uh, can be found or recognized or embraced in extra musical situations. So what I'd like to do today is to talk a little bit about the interpretation of music through one very specific lens and then uh, see if we can make some parallels between uh, the interpretation of music and interpretation in our lives in general. So we start off with a little bit of music. There she stood in my doorway so boldly and she whispered of pleasures I'd missed. Though at first I refused very coldly, but how long can a fella resist? How long can a fella resist? I said, no. She said, please. I said, no. She said, please. I said, no. She said, please. Pretty baby, I said no. She said why? I said no. She said why? I said no. She said try, and I said well, maybe. She said now. I said well. She said oh, this is swell, and you'll never know how much it will mean. So at last I confess. I said yes, 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 yes. That's how I subscribe to Liberty Magazine. <laughs> so, let's talk a little bit about interpretation. Interpretation is really, in music world, it's just the term that we use to describe the set of choices that the performer is involved in, the performer or the composer. Um, the, as I'm playing the piano and I'm singing, all along the while, every moment that I'm there, for the most part, every moment, I'm involved in multiple choices. Um, and my, I have multiple choices are going, and they overlap with each other. Some of them are an instant, some of them have something to do over time. Um, but it's really just a series of choices that I'm making that makes me an interpreter. Now, it doesn't necessarily make me a successful interpreter, but it does make me an interpreter to be involved in the choices. The first level of choices that I'm involved in I think are rather obvious things. They're the what of my performance. So what piano, what, what instrument, what words, what notes, what volume, what speed, all of those sorts of things are sort of the, the obvious 
initial things. Uh, the second tier, though, uh, a more important tier of choices that I'm involved in are the how of my performance. And artistry, if it's ever to be accomplished, is all about the how. How is it that we progress through these different ideas? Uh, in my classroom, we take a little bit of time to talk about the difference between what we call art and what we think of as artful. Um, art uh, can be the dry paint on the canvas um, or the, the printed notes on the page. A piece of art can live in a drawer or in a vault or can be in the darkened hallways of the museum down the, down the way. Whereas artful is the term that I use to describe our interaction with any of those settings. To be artful, you have to, uh, you have to be involved. It's a dynamic interaction. Whereas it's, I believe that it's possible for a piece of art to be static, um, it is uh, impossible to be involved in something that is artful without becoming dynamic in some way. As I'm playing my song and doing my best to be artful, it's really not my experience that matters so much. It's much more important is what is your experience? And was there any part of what I did that you felt was artful? Well, you can't make that decision unless you're somehow a participant in what it is that I do. We would have to communicate in some manner. You'd have to be vested. You'd have to buy in uh, to some extent. Uh, and then once you've started your buy-in and you think, oh, what are the what's of his performance? What words? What was that story? What's he talking about? Did he say the word magazine? And then you, uh, and then you have to go a step or two beyond that to find the how of the performance and see if you experience the how with me. And only then can we find some sort of common ground and maybe the situation could become artful. Um, uh, the, uh, in order to uh, get into this a little deeper, I've got three quick little studies for you. So if you would just consider three examples. Example number one, I'd like you to uh, look far up to your left and just assume that there's something very important. We'll call it a dot. Let's just assume there's a big important dot there and there's another one directly above my head, maybe seven feet above, and we'll put another one here to your right. Um, and we've got these very important dots. These could signify all sorts of things. It could be a very important note or an important event, but we've got an important event and another and another. Um, would you just look to the first and now would you look to the second, and then I ask, how do you get there? How did you get from the first one to the second? Um, if you were a computer working in a digital binary world, um, as I understand it, that, that world is uh, based on ones and zeros. It's either on or it's off. So it would be possible to be at the first point, and then in an instant be at the second point, and in an instant find yourself at the third point. Whereas we, we are analog all the way. There's no way to get from one point to the next without first traveling the space in between. And it's in the space between these important events um, where artistry could be found. So we first, rule number one, truth number one, is to embrace the space between those points. Yeah? So I have a, uh, a second one. Now this was a very special, took some great, uh, some great work to, to get this to happen. I've brought in, though, uh, a guest. We have a guest. He is a playground expert. Um, if you would please uh, welcome with me um, eight-year-old Master Liam, who's going to come out and show us. Let's go to it. Consider the playground swing. The playground swing is really, I think, one of the most important uh, inventions of, our, of, of the ages. Uh, if you think about it, the playground swing is everywhere. It's age old. We've had playground swings as long as anybody can remember. Um, and it seems that even the most modern, the fanciest playgrounds that we build, they all still seem to contain this playground swing. What is it about the playground swing that's so special? Why is it we keep going to it? I would bet there's not a person in the room who's not been on a playground swing. And I bet most of you are thinking, man, if only I could ride that swing right now. <laughs> That's it, right? That's where it's at. Well, let's take a moment and try to analyze. If we take a hold of Liam here and we stop him in place, isn't that awful? He has to sit still. <laughs> Not unlike your experience sitting out there. At stillness, he told me this morning he weighs 57 pounds. 57, right there he is, all of 57 pounds, sitting still um, in that place. Um, he is, go ahead, you can start back up. He is. At 57 pounds, he has the experience of weighing 57. It feels static, he's at rest, he's, he's, he's kind of stuck there. Now the moment he gets back into motion though, his experience of weight shifts. He doesn't get to feel 57 anymore. For this bit of time that he's on the swing, he gets to be dynamic, he gets to feel something other than 57. As he rides, as he rides into the bottom of the swing, he actually gains weight. He gets to feel heavier than himself. That's really kind of special. And as he rides out the very top on either end, he not only sheds weight, he sheds so much weight that he becomes weightless. He gets to float. He gets to defy gravity. And it's really quite a wild ride. I mean, for any of us, yeah? I mean, for any of us to get a chance to be something other than yourself, to be, get a chance to do something greater than you, which is to pick up weight or to shed weight there, it's a magical sort of, 
uh, a, a magical sort of experience. Now we add one more thing into it, and that is his progression from weightless to weightful to weightless to weightful isn't something he's choosing. He doesn't get to decide how, how today I think I'll gain weight this sort of way, or I'll shed, I'll be weightless in this other way. He doesn't decide, I didn't decide, some artist didn't make it up, some engineer didn't make something that forces him in one way or another. Instead, it's a truthful motion. It's an authentic forward motion. An authentic forward motion is the term in my class that, that we describe as the holy grail of musicianship. How are we gonna get from one point to another point in the most honest way possible? It's a, it's a, it's a special uh, occurrence, and, and it's not one to take lightly. If I were to instead uh, invent some machine that just pushed him through space, we would deem the gesture as unnatural. It would seem forced or mechanical. My interp as an interpreter, if I try to play my music in that same manner, you would say, well, he hit the notes, but uh, you know, it's felt so forced or so mechanical. We get all of these sort of awful criticisms from the critics of the world, and those are the types of uh, criticisms that we get. Hey, uh, a quick round of applause for Liam. He's the man. You're good. Head on out. Can you do it? How are you going to get off? There he is. <laughs> consider a third, uh, a third quick study. I'd like you to consider the, the conductor, the orchestral conductor. Now, whether you've spent too much time at the symphony or the opera or the ballet or not, I'm betting that most of you have a picture in your mind of, of the conductor and what they do. The way it works in classical music world is lots and lots of people spend lifetimes trying to get really, really good at their instrument. And then they audition and we go and search for them and we take the very best that we can find of multiple instruments and we put them together into these large ensembles. And then we search for the one person whose job it gets to be to lead that group, to be in front of everybody. That person in the front um, gets to be the artistic vision for the whole crowd. These conductors are, are for the most part deemed to have some of the highest levels of musicianship of anybody that we can find. They're the leader. And as they do their job, um, I think they're actually pretty uh, amazing because as the leader of the musical world, they make no sound. They are, they are silent people on the whole. They make, they make no sound at all. They're not involved in making sound at all. Um, they don't talk. They, um, their major tool, the main thing that they do is they gesture. They use physical motion as the leading tool. And, I, and they, there's the... Uh, series of patterns that they all know. They do it, if you go worldwide, anywhere on this globe and find a conductor, they all know the same patterns. Rather than thinking about the patterns today, I'd like you just to look at the quality of the gesture. They would all recognize the quality of this gesture. Um, in the conducting gesture, if you take a look, you might see that there's something in common between this gesture and this gesture of the playground swing. Built into this gesture are moments of heaviness and moments of lightness. Moments of heaviness, moments of lightness. And it's not just heavy, it's not a forced heavy, but an actual authentic heavy and afloat and more weight and less weight. Um, and what they're doing by conducting is they're creating a playground swing and then they're inviting their ensemble to ride the swing with them as though we could get all of these symphony players on the same one swing and all push through it in ensemble is the term that we use. And not only is the hope that their ensemble would ride the swing with them, but the real hope is that their audience would figure out some way to ride the swing with them, that there could be buy-in from out there as well. So um, uh, the quickest lesson in conducting, are you all ready? So uh, music is quite often broken up into measures or bars, um, and the very first beat of a bar of music is called the what, do you know? Yes, yeah, the downbeat, you win. Put everybody two hands up. Quick, 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 I only have a little bit of time. And so the first beat in a bar of music goes down. So show me, down. And the last beat of any bar of music is the? Upbeat, it goes up, and if that's all you got, do it, swing it. You're swinging at Ted, swinging at Ted. Very good. Now, if we, you look great. You look great. Now, if we don't worry about what beat of the bar we're on, can you just show me a swinging gesture? Like you got your own playground swing right there, right on. And in your swing, it's not just right, left. It's heavy, light, heavy, light, heavy, light. You have to find the heavy or you're nowhere, right? Now, what I'd like you to do is I'm going to sing my song again, um, but this time I'd like you to do your best to reinterpret my song. I'd like you to listen to it anew. Now, while you'll still notice the what of my song, I think, you'll still hear a story and you'll know I'm on a piano. I'd like you instead to try really hard to hear it through a new lens. This time, I'd like you just to search for what feels heavy and what feels light. And is my progression from heavy to light authentic? Does it feel forward moving? Does it, does it move you? Yeah? So we try. You have to conduct along. You're forced to. So you, you have no choice. You have to swing. <laughs> right? So we go again. Swing. There she stood in my doorway so boldly. 
maybe you thought, there she stood in my doorway so boldly. Or maybe you thought, there she stood in my doorway so boldly. You get to choose, and you don't have to agree with your neighbor or necessarily with what I'm thinking. You're the interpreter, right? And she whispered of pleasures I'd missed. Though at first I refused very coldly. And how long can a fella resist? How long can a fella resist? I said no. She said please. I said no. She said please. I said no. She said please, pretty baby. I said no, she said why, I said no, she said why, I said no, she said try, I said well maybe, she said now, I said well, she said oh this is swell, and the moonlight in her eyes was sublime. So at last, I confess, I said yes, 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 yes. That's the word I really meant to say all the time. So could you do it? Could you find it? Could you find the moment of heavy and something that seemed light? And then you as the participant in it, just through this one lens, of course there are many lenses, but the, through this one lens, if you can find some amount of common ground and you think, oh, well maybe this isn't about a story at all, maybe this is about trying to just push me through space. The, uh, the, the artful experience or the, the musical experience is not defined by just recognizing what is important. One important note to another important note, one important idea to another important idea. It's not just about composition, that we've placed certain things around, but rather it's something that is to be dynamic, it's something that it has to be experienced, and you have to figure out what is your role in that. How are you able to find that experience? What's your common ground? If you go down the street to, we have this most amazing uh, 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 painting gallery down the street. Um, if you were to go into the painting gallery, as soon as you'd step in the door, you'd look around and you'd think, oh look, art. There's art everywhere around me. I see art and art and art and art and art. It's all art. But is it artful? At what point does it become artful? Well, the only way it could be artful, the only way it could actually touch you or move you would be if you would somehow uh, come together with it. So you, you find one and you look at it and you think, well, where's the what? Oh, well, I see a dog and a brook and, a, and this and that and it does this. And then can you note those important points and then, and then think, does it move you? How is your eye led from one into the other? Remember, embrace the space in between and then compare that to some sort of natural gesture that would bring you through space. Um, to the extent that you, can, that you can find both the what and the how and feel as though you are brought there in a truthful manner, um, then it, you know, the odds are you're, you're prime for some sort of artful experience. The beautiful participation or the artful experience is something to aspire to. It, uh, uh, when, we're, you know, when we're not looking, sometimes it'll catch us without, without paying attention. But there are many, many other opportunities in our, in our daily life where you, if you would just open up and allow yourself to see it, you could be a part of it. You'd have this opportunity to participate. One of my very favorite places to look for it is in good conversation with good friends. Um, while I could go back and think about the transcript and say, oh, here, we talked about this, and we talked about this, and we talked about this, it, which by themselves could be really interesting. Most often, I am most gratified by thinking about how we got from one topic to the next and how we got from one topic to the next. The beautiful participation is something to aspire to. And if you can just take some time to consider it, you might be privy to a moment of beauty that you would have otherwise been too busy to notice. Thank you so, so much. <laughs>